You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome back to Music Tectonics, where we go beneath the surface of music and tech. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm also the founder and CEO of Rock, Paper, Scissors. We are a music tech PR firm. And today's guest is Imogen Heap, the pioneering singer-songwriter, producer, and audio engineer. You might know her from her gold record, Speak for Yourself, or from hearing her song, Hide and Seek, on the OC back in the day. But as Music Tectonics listeners, you probably also know her from uh, her blockchain platform, Mycelia, which she used in 2015 to release her single, Tiny Human, and which became the basis for the Creative Passport, which we'll get into in our conversation. Or even more likely, you might know Imogen from her wearable, expressive musical instrument, Mimu Gloves, and its accompanying app, uh, Glover and Gliss. Uh, Welcome to Music Tectonics, Imogen Heap. Hello. Thank you very much. Feeling very welcome. Yeah, it's great to have you here. (laughs) Thank you um, for making the time. Um, I'm going to dive right in because there's tons I want to ask you. Um, A lot of artists learn their craft and stay focused on writing, recording, touring, making a career. But you've dug into the technology beneath the industry's framework, inventing your own musical instruments to go with how you see artists performing and audiences enjoying music. I'm curious, what were early influences in your life that set you on this kind of unique path of finding creativity beyond just the song? writing, but around shifting the business model, around technology, the stuff you uh, make to make music? I think it really is just the the tie is frustration. I'm just frustrated because I can't do this thing, it doesn't exist, or I'm spending too much time doing this thing. How can I simplify that flow? And that ends up like 10 years later trying to get something that does end up simplifying it. Um, but it's that drive, that frustration of I wish life could be simpler. I know it could be simpler. I am going to try and do something about it. And that seems to be the connect. Cool. All right. Well, we may get into a little bit more around influences as we go, but let's dive into your technology. What is Mycelia and how did you come up with the idea? So Mycelia is really just an idea. Um, it, it it doesn't have any technology. It's it's really just a, um, a play space to explore technologies um, around the blockchain space initially. It became alive um, after a conversation for an interview piece in Forbes, George Howard asked me how I was working with blockchain and music. And at the time I wasn't, I was just really inspired by what could happen if things were integrated differently, if we had different payment flows, if we could see the history of events um, and people could author into um, a shared data set. And because a lot of the problems in our industry are around these very fragmented data sets that we have. Um, So I got excited and I started to talk to other people in the blockchain space um, and be inspired by their energy. And I found this new energy for wanting to help music makers in this space, whereas we've been kind of moaning about it for the last hundred years. But because there's a potential tech solution, all of a sudden it became something that I was allowed to talk about rather than just like people rolling their eyeballs going, oh, here we go again. So that was why, really, blockchain. Um, and it was thanks to my dear friend Zoe Keating who introduced me to the concept in the first place, to this thing called blockchain. I had never heard about it. Uh, I was four months into motherhood at the time and about to think about releasing a song. And just the dread, really, of the adding to the problem of releasing another song out there, knowing that there was going to be all these loose ends everywhere, Um not being able to credit people properly, knowing that people weren't going to get paid. You know, how could I even just attach the right lyrics to a song so that it doesn't get misquoted? Um, So, yeah, I basically put together a hack weekend um, in Shoreditch. And that was when I met this group from um, uh, called Ujo, Ujo Music, Phil Barry. And we put together, well, they put together um, a smart contract to make payments to all of the musicians and all the splits that were part of this hack weekend. I basically had a massive folder. I think it was a Dropbox folder or Google Doc, you know, just a huge folder of like songs, stems, rights, licenses, correct lyrics, inspiration, everything, you know, to do with the song, like lyrics, this is all everything. This is all about your music. These were all songs that you'd written. 
It was all one song. It was literally one song. The world of one song. That's the thing is that, you know, what we see on a streaming service is literally one line of information. It's like the name of the artist and then the name of the song and maybe the time of the song. Um, But nothing, very little. I mean, you can go into song credits, but it's a bit of a faff to find it. And when you get there, it's very limited. Um, It's hard to add data there. You know, you have to go through organisations to do that. You can't just do it. Um, So... Yeah, this was really just the what you see in the on the on the streaming service is literally the tip of the iceberg. In fact, it's even the penguin on the top of the iceberg. It's like this <laughs> tiny, tiny bit of information compared to the hundreds of people that are usually involved in some way or another connect to the song, whether they're your publisher, label manager, you know, musicians, inspiration, person who commissioned it in the first place, what you wrote on it, what you played, you know, all that stuff, what mic you used. Um, so many things, so many points of data for discovery. Um, because that's also what it's about how do we help these songs be discovered it's so hard when there's two new tracks uploaded every second of every day um how do you shout above the noise without shouting because we're all a bit bored of shouting and marketing ourselves Mm -hmm. um so yeah that's what it was about gave all this information to this uh in on this hack weekend uh in in shoreditch and what came about were a few different things but one of them was the first song to use a smart contract to distribute payments on the blockchain on the ethereum blockchain and i was pretty excited all the developers were pretty excited um we thought we'd really achieve something uh we raised well we sold 222 copies which you know is not a lot of copies but for back then it was really hard to get ether and it's It was an unknown space and loads of my fans didn't know how to sign in and do anything, nor did I. You know, it was like total learning curve. Um, But what it meant was we got some Ether. We got like, you know, one Ether per per track download. And at the time it was worth 0.6 of a a dollar. And then about a year later, you know, um, that was up there in a $200,000 what that was worth and that paid for the beginning of what we now call the creative passport which is where all of that research led to um, about how music makers can prepare for the future where we do have such a integrated um, space where it kind of starts to make sense so let me ask you real quick you, when, when I asked you the question originally, you said there's no technology there. It's just an idea. But clearly there's technology there. There's no hardware. There is now. There is now, yeah. I mean, back then it was it was a bunch of people in a room. They had the know-how. You know, they were the coders and the developers. I was there with an idea. Not really a full exact idea of what that would be. Um, but we did what we could with the technology we had at the time. And it was pretty groundbreaking um, what they did and very exciting and it set us on a path of discovery and research and later development. I didn't go into this wanting to develop something you know I do like making music (laughs) I don't have a lot of time to do it but I pretty much dedicated my life for, for the rest of like for about three years after that to this idea of what can musicians do what can we do to prepare for that future so that we're not always you know at the tail end of um a revenue stream or, you know, a kind of an afterthought with services. Not because, not even an afterthought, I just say a difficulty. You know, we're hard to interface with directly because we are nowhere. We know we're at the end of a management company or a Twitter feed or a LinkedIn page, but we don't have a way to integrate. Um, and there's many millions of us around the world. And that's where all this, you know, half of all of the royalties around the world just go missing you know into into certain people's pockets and there's no incentive to get that right because you know publishers and labels they get that money where it can't be found um and collection societies too so we just need to step up and we think we have a solution or part of a solution which just is to empower music makers to to basically get their data in order, get ready for action, ready for business so that we can show ourselves in our hundreds of thousands and services, you know, start to raise eyebrows and go, oh, right, that's actually really useful. Let's go over there because we know that that's actually Imogen Heap because she's verified already. We don't need to do that. Know your customer. How do we know that's really Imogen Heap that says she's Imogen Heap, you know? So we're solving that bit. And it's... um. We're not solving the discovery bit. We're not solving the services bit or the payments bit. We're literally just solving the, I'm Imogen Heap. 
here's my all my different identifiers in the industry that they currently are here's my skill set here's my passions here's my website here's my socials here's my biography here's my press image you know all that stuff that a lot of the time people are asking for time and time again so all of those kind of fields or categories of of data structure that you just mentioned that's the thing that makes up the creative passport is that right that's right yeah got it yeah it's a data store basically a knowledge store and and is that connected to to blockchain creative passport it's not no. Currently, it uses we use Amazon Web Services um, for for hostage, um, but we also use your you know your phone. You basically use your phone if you want to back up, then we we can do a backup for you. But it's not holding any you know really sensitive data. It's not holding your passport information or your banking information or anything like that. Um, it's it's funded primarily by me. I'm actually just in the process of sending uh, video messages directly to friends with money um, because this is a non-profit, but the friends with money who are in the music industry. All of those um, friends with money of I- Imogen Heap, please call yes, Imogen Heap right it, now and contribute money number. to the process. <laughs> Exactly. Um, yeah. So we just we just need cash. We've got a great thing going for us. We've got about three thousand musicians signed up. Um, you know, inputting their their data. But we need it. We need work. You know, on the on the website and on the on the portal for sure. So right now, it's really a collection, a database collection where people can come in and say, "This is all my stuff. This is who I am. This is my metadata," and you get it all at once. And I'm assuming this could have technically have been solved with labels and distribution companies at some point, but you're saying you don't think overall they were incentivized to deal with all this data. And so it kind of, they, they, they took the minimum viable data, pumped it through, and then as a result, there just wasn't quite enough info for discovery or even for uh, payment to splits and all the different rights and so forth. Yeah, well, even just at the basic, you can't um, connect. They don't have a way to connect the song identifier with the recording identifier. Um, they're two different, completely different sets of information and they're just figuring out a way to do that. But I'm like, hello, I'm a musician and I have both. Um, you know, I we can help be a part of that that problem. That's just one of the many problems. Um, but you can see why it's not been done because it's, you know, it's for people with not just one hat. I mean, musicians often have many hats. They're a performer, they're a producer, they're a writer, they're a, you know, um, they might be a session musician, they're a gigging person. You know, they've got so many different hats and not one particular service or one particular label has an interest to develop this thing for the whole person. Um, so it makes sense that it's going to be a musician to start it because actually it's not really understood the problem because that's that is the problem with the music industry it's very segmented um very fragmented and we feel fragmented you know our our bits of the industry don't talk to each other and you know one collection society might sort out some information but then the one over there in spain doesn't have access to that information and nor does the one in the states and then they're all trying to solve the same problem and they're paying you know in 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 their in their companies to do that and essentially that's coming off the top of our money so it's ridiculous you know it's ridiculous so that's at creativepassport.net if artists want to sign up and start putting their data in if people want to donate that's all on the website you know, I, I'm curious, uh, are, are you seeing progress in the world of artist rights and monetization since you started Mycelia, since you launched Creative Passport? Are you seeing things progress beyond your own projects? Are you seeing the industry yeah. as a whole making progress here? I'm seeing definitely more awareness, um, understanding the need for good data. Um, and there are tools, you know, services like Spotify, who have Spotify for Artists, where you can go in and add information now yourself but that's also pretty exhausting because you've got Spotify to do it for you've got Apple Music to do it for there's another thing over here there's another thing over there it's just once you've updated one it's like it's like that person who goes and paints the um the the Golden Gate Bridge you know they start at one end and then they get to the other and they've got to go start it again um so it's just like that's what it feels like but if we had one place to just the truth is there your biography is there any information that's currently you know, relevant right then and now should be, you know, pumped out to all the necessary places without the need for you to go have to sign in, log in, type in the information, do it in their format, la, la, la. You know, you could have multiple different formats, multiple lengths, um, and your APIs would do the work. Right, got it. All right, well, we're going to take a quick break. Imogen, when we come back, I want to ask you about the current explosion of NFTs and see what you Mm -hmm. think there. All right, we'll be right back. 
It's happening. Get your tickets for Music Tectonics 2021 conference now. Get a special early bird rate now until August 3rd at musictectonics.com. That means you'll pay just $69 to get access to three experiences online, in the metaverse, and on a carousel by the sea. No, really, literally. Mix and match to get a conference experience like no other. One ticket gets you access to online events October 25th through October 27th, and in-person events outdoors by the sea in Los Angeles on November 2nd. That's three mornings online with keynotes, interactive panels, and speed networking on Hopin's video conference but better platform, and three afternoons in the metaverse with keynotes, instrument demos, exhibitor booths, and chance meetings in Deggy World, an avatar-based conference campus, no VR headset required. Then, one day in Los Angeles of in-person networking in real-world spaces way beyond the typical conference hotel. Bring that stack of business cards that's been gathering dust. You're going to need them. Don't just talk about innovation in music. Experience it at Music Tectonics. Get your early bird ticket at musictectonics.com before they're gone. All right, we are back. Uh, thanks for staying tuned in. Um, Imogen Heaps here. And as I said, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about the current explosion of NFTs? Is that something you're tracking on? It seems kind of related to what we've been talking about, but it's uh, a, a special new tangent that there's a lot of excitement about. Yeah, um, I am I am intrigued. Um, I've dipped my toe in this the NFT water about two weeks ago. I'd had a lot of people be in touch saying, Imogen, Imogen, you've got to get on an NFT. You're going to make loads of money. And I'm like, oh, brilliant. I need loads of money for the Creative Passport. Come on, let's do this. Um, so I had a few people reach out to say they wanted to do one with me. But at the time, I didn't have the time. Um, but then I bumped into my dear friend, Tim Exile, who has this amazing kind of social music making app called Endless. And I just love him and he lives really close. So I was just on a call to Carlotta, who's our CEO of the Creative Passport. And there he was thinking about some amazing massive thing. And we just started talking and he said, look, Endless, uh, Endless we're going to start minting riffs as NFTs. And I was like, oh, right, that sounds super cool can I do one he was like yes you can because you're like you did something like this didn't you five and a half years ago um so I said well yeah kind of but I you know I had to get to the bottom to understand really what was going on so five and a half years ago we did put a piece of artwork you know like the front cover with a piece of music but and with you know whatever metadata we could and the splits but it wasn't didn't involve a receipt didn't involve a token um couldn't be tracked or you know if it got sold on to somebody else, that that mechanism wasn't there. But it would have, I would have done it if it was possible. Um, so we had all these kind of grand visions, but that's what we did at the time. So with Tim, yeah, I, I won't go too much into it because it'll take forever. But um, basically, we just created these six individual riffs, which is like a short form musical um, concept form of Tim's with Endless. Um, you basically create these riffs on the fly wherever you are. It's really fun, super, super fun to do. If there's any musicians out there, get into it because it can just get you into that flow like in an instant and you're there with other people if you want to be or yourself, if not, great sounds. Um, so there, I had these riffs and I played him one right then and there. I was like, oh, okay, well, I want to play you this because I just came up with it this morning and I was literally like playing around with it in the park. So I played it to him and there's me singing around. He took a video of me like miming to this idea. And then that became the basis of the NFT where um, my longtime friend and designer, Andy Khan, created the visual, um, the visualizer, the visualization out of that video. And we connected that to the NFT. Um, and then we found uh, Tim had this guy called Sam Parker who put the NFT together and it was really interesting, like got my head around slightly around the different marketplaces, um, the different commissions, the different issues. And it's really, really hard to navigate around. Very hard. There's not a lot of I mean, there's people willing to share, but you've got to find them, talk to them. Um, and actually Clubhouse is where people are going to talk about them. Um, so that's where I ended up kind of being, you know, I had I'd kind of been invited to a demo version of it about six months before but I hadn't been in there since and then all of a sudden there's like a gazillion people in there talking about mostly blockchain and uh, VR and you know kind of stuff that I enjoy talking about um so yeah I was in there listening to people talk but it really was more that it was just an experiment really I mean I would have liked to have made money out of it but to be honest we didn't really make money out of it because what 
transpires is that just like music you can't just like suddenly put something good out there and immediately receive some money um it needs a whole like juggernaut of pr behind it for people to discover it and i naively thought that because i'm imogen heath because i have a history of blockchain that all those nice blockchain people back in the day who've got a lot of ether now um might just for what's the word posterity Posterity. yeah Yeah, would would kind of be interested and go oh yeah we'll we'll buy that from imogen help her you know but that didn't happen we got like 20 views or something um in the first hour and we kind of thought it'd be way above that and then we only set it to 24 hours and we completely (laughs) didn't reach anyone and then eventually some people in clubhouse kind of took pity on uh, on me um and started to come into our room and we had like two and a half thousand people all of a sudden because Dom Diablo came in and this girl Steph came in, who's like head of relations on Clubhouse and another guy called William came in. And it was like this really like, oh, Imogen, oh, we just really want you to come on, let's figure it out. Um, and the only person that bought one uh, was Don Diablo, who he's been very successful um, with his NFTs. But he has taken a whole year to really, you know, hone in on what that NFT was going to be. And he really researched it and he like lives and breathes it. And that's what you need to do to make a success of an NFT. That's what I was going to yeah. say. So it's not ready for it. Not ready for people like me to just like jump in there for a couple of weeks and think I'm going to make some money. And that's what a lot of musicians are hoping for is that, oh, this is finally a chance to make money. Um, but it it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, right. And and it's like it's it's sort of like any social media platform or any new format where you kind of have to be a part of the community for a period to grow your because, you know, it's it's like you said, I mean, even even though you said back when you, you released your track through Mycelia, it, there was no easy way to do it. People couldn't even get Ethereum to actually do it. And um, it's still it's still like that. Like you still have to log into certain places, create accounts add yeah. funds, you know, through 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 multiple wallets and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's not like a turnkey thing where, you know, people have gotten used to just with one swipe buying something on Amazon. NFTs aren't there. Although I did read recently that eBay is interested in NFTs, um, <laughs> which is kind of a funny thing if you think about the Beanie Baby trend, yeah. you know, when of, of collectibles and moving into digital collectibles. And what mm-hmm. I think is kind of interesting about it, which is related to our earlier conversation today was, is just that it's like a parallel universe, you know, like just like you were saying, there's kind of this existing infrastructure for labels, distributors, streaming service, all that stuff where all they need is the track, you know, the track title, the artist name and the length of the track. And they've got obviously they've got some uh, payout data to, to make sure people get paid some of their money, at least. Um, mm-hmm. But um, but when you when you put your track out directly with smart contracts, it's kind of like, well, now there's an actual kind of like uh, universal record that you've created that's verified by you. That's kind of this parallel universe that people could tap into at some point. Um, mm-hmm. And then it's similar with NFTs. It's like, it's not that different from the, you know, 10 or 20 year run of direct to fan conversations about how online you create direct to fan opportunities. It's just, it's kind of in this, it's not like you just go to a website and click buy t-shirt and then it ships to you, right? It's, it's this other right. thing that um yeah it's very early days uh, but i think the possibilities i know the possibilities are exciting because essentially you know with outlets like you know spotify whatever the streaming services are very limited to what you're listening to or engaging with and the exciting thing about these nfts which hopefully that one day they won't be called nfts because it's like the worst name ever um well be... even fungible non-fungible it's not yeah, just I mean, non-fungible like, eh. <laughs> yeah exactly i like I had to look at what's fungible okay <laughs> now we know what well it's not that <laughs> exactly <laughs> um so but it, essentially it's like you can get your most creative you know you could combine you could say, I'm going to wash your sink at the same time as singing a song for you. And at the same time, you get free tickets to all my concerts. You know, you could just make up whatever you want in the unlockables. Not that I would want to go and wash anyone's sink. Um, but it could be like dinner when I come to your town. Or, they could or wash could be, your sink. <laughs> exactly. You can come and wash my sink by all means. Um, so it's actually got lots of green paint in it at the moment because Scout chucked loads of green paint all over it. Oh. Um, so there's so many possibilities. And I get excited about... And, I kind of feel like the trajectory is what we have right now, which is musicians kind of crowbarring themselves into a very limited space of discovery um, with very, you know, little tools to be discovered. Um, You're just kind of at the whim of an algorithm or somebody who might like a music on the play, who does the playlists. Um, And then the other side, which is your song, a piece of music, which is like 
fully packed with information like about anything you could possibly want to know about that song and then you could on top of that layer then you've got also how other people interact with it and where they find it useful whether they're going running apps or having sex with it or whatever they're doing like kind of extra tag words around that and then beyond that like what services are finding it useful or what brands are finding it useful or you know what kind of instruments um you've used in that song that might take you on a journey to what other instruments are used on other songs so it's like worlds of songs instead of like these big kind of excel spreadsheets of um the way we listen to music but these kind of worlds of songs of loads of layers of context and possibility and then the services just having no limitation to their imagination of how, how they can inter, interact with those pieces of music. It could be radio. It could be that you decide to write into that piece of music um, when this music gets played and there is a disaster in Japan, you know, because I love Japan, or there's a something around something ecological or something around an oil spill or whatever it might be, then I want this song to trigger payment to these charities. Or And then radio stations could decide, oh, we're only going to play music which is going to be dedicating monies to go to these specific initiatives. You know, you could do all kinds of things when things are interconnected and hyperlinked and, you know, kind of firing information to each other. Um, There's just so many possibilities. But right now, a song goes into a thing, gets ingested in, and it just stays there in that format and we can't update it. But if you had uh, a point, I mean, I'm not saying that's what NFTs are right now at all, (laughs) but it just feels like it could go into that direction um, because it's these individually individually designed things that have a bunch of functionality. Um, So I'm quite excited about I'm excited about it. Yeah, I I think it does open up opportunities for creativity on how music and the things around music are creatively packaged and offered up to a a, a different type of engagement with fans and listeners and Mm -hmm. and so forth. And then there's the whole like secondary market side of it, too. Right. Where instead of just buying music, you're kind of making an investment in something that's collectible and both the original creator and the person who invested in it could potentially get something out of it i don't know how that all works but i've heard it's happening (laughs) it is and it's happening for the first time and in fact even five years ago i remember hearing about a company called artbyte who were selling art on the blockchain connected using rfids and that when that piece of work got sold then um it was tracked on the blockchain and then there would be a payment distributed on the uplift uh, of a royalty so say 10 percent or whatever would be paid back to the artist the originator so currently that never happens you know you buy something like a young Damien Hurst might have sold something to you when you were when he was 20 and you were like oh that's nice um and then you sold it you know 10 years on for like 2 million um that person doesn't receive any of that uplift uh, so that's that's actually becoming the norm now which is great and that's because of the the possibility in the technology five years ago kind of made us think oh we could do that and now it's filtering back into the real world so it's having an impact um not just in its own space well and sure and what's cool about that is it's more aligned with how people share music now how how music's transferring to people as well like this idea of somehow by sharing music you can benefit but also the creator can benefit i mean that's getting it even further down the pike right but you, yeah. can, you can imagine a place where whoever discovers the artist and then shares it also is incentivized to 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 help spread Absolutely. it on but the artist is it's not like it's not like sharing like oh i've uploaded music illegally to youtube that i don't own but mm-hmm. somehow you know incorporating this collaborative element where everybody's kind of incentivized to yeah i mean that's sharing. always that's always been the bother is is you know kind of vilifying your fans um mm. when there was a lot of spat of people being arrested for illegally uploading mp3s and sharing stuff that they loved um was because quite a lot of the time they were just fans you know just really wanting to share music they loved um and it's hard to go and find that weird piece of music in a you know store in the middle of arkansas or whatever um so why not be able to to do that it people go where things are the easiest you know and that's what we need to develop is the technology to make our lives easier and it feels like at the moment the industry is not easy it's not easy for artists it's not even easy for services to innovate with um and it's not easy for the companies to navigate around it and i think it's reached uh, a tipping point where everyone's just a little bit like okay let's just make this simpler okay we agree it's been nice for a while 
I'm talking about the, the, the major labels. Um, but now it needs a change because there's a possibility here of making life smoother and simpler for everyone. Um, and it's got to a point where a lot of artists don't want to sign to major labels anymore because they, they've they heard the horror stories. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited. And I think it, it kind of leads a future, not just in music, but in everything. If we all imagine that we can, our ideas, our thoughts and ideas and our, you know, the kind of projects that we develop over time, over our lives, can have a history and place and time and can be kind of, you know little flag posts of ideas that can lead you right back to your childhood where you could see a line of events and people could see oh wow she's been working on this you know and having these ideas and dropping them into the blockchain or whatever it would just become part of our world um and that people can see that they they you know have been very passionate about things and they've developed these things and then very you know early on I might have had a teacher who might be like you know what? I really think Imogen's got something here I'm going to I'm going to give her 200 quid, you know, and help her buy her first whatever keyboard. Um, and had they done that and might receive a, you know, but that would have been a huge impact, for, amazing for me to have so young. So to, or somebody go, oh, I'm going to buy Imogen an Atari computer. You know, I would have been able to do that for so much, so much more stuff could have been done early on and maybe I'd be ahead of where I am now. Um, so it just means that every single person, whether it's an environmental you know, uh, initiative that you want to push or it's a local art gallery or it's a food store. You, you just, you can just start to invest in things you and people you believe in um, because you're all in it together. And I just think that's a wonderful future. To oh, believe. Awesome. Awesome. Love talking about this. All right. We need to take one more quick break for an announcement. And when we come back, I want to ask you about another invention of yours in the <laughs> wearables world. We'll be right back. What's up, beautiful listeners? I've got a question for you. What do you want to hear next? Let me know at pages.musictectonics.com slash feedback. Suggest future guests and music tech topics you want to hear us cover and tell us how we're doing. Again, that's pages.musictectonics.com slash feedback. Look forward to hearing from you. All right, we are back. Let's leapfrog over to your other technology endeavor, Mimu Gloves. Am I saying it right? Imogen? Maybe, yeah, like me and music, that's right. Right. So I first saw these in an actual performance at South by Southwest at something called the Living Museum, and it really was a living museum with humans doing things, <laughs> including <laughs> performing. Um, Chagall, who I believe works with you, um, was yeah. the performer of the gloves. Um, so these are gloves that act as expressive controllers for electronic music of some sort. What made you develop them? Uh, again, frustration. <laughs> it's like being on tour, um, just it's just a bit fed up of having to like run back to base station to just do something simple like record a loop or add a bit of reverb or, you know, bring something, bring some sample in. Just not wanting to have to keep coming back to this like keyboard or a bunch of buttons. Um, and often to, to get some kind of spontaneity or flow, it, I had to have things all kind of dotted around the stage, like I would have pads on the floor, like a square thing that was made by a company called iCubex, which was connected to my computer um, so that I could just trigger some loops while I was standing at the, uh, you know, in the center stage. But really it started to change when I started to wear a headset microphone and I used to wear these lapel microphones on my wrists because then I could go and record sound without having like loads of different um microphones everywhere oh, i cool. could just go to where the sound was and in it would go and obviously kind of like spider to... spider-man you would just exactly, like, yeah. spider <laughs> shoot, shoot your microphone <laughs> yeah um but then i needed to but then in order to record it um or to like stop record i'd have to like press record run over quickly record a thing run back press stop you know so it would involve um a lot of empty space and it wouldn't be the best sound recording so yeah Eventually, I actually came across this amazing um, developer called Ellie Jessup, and she was developing something called the VAMP system. Um, and it was my friend Kelly Snook, who later worked on the gloves with us, who introduced me to her. And she just showed me this glove that she was developing, which was like a long, a long full arm glove. And what she'd done is she sang to me she just sang a note she la 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 and then when she sang the last note she made a little pinch um like as if she's kind of picking up something with her forefinger and her thumb and then she 
uh, would capture a snapshot, a little nanosecond of that audio, and then it would synthesize into a tone. And then she would move her her hand like a vibrato and it would make the tone go. And I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. You know, why? Well, of course, you just use your hands. I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know you could do that. Um, it's like so, sonic augmented reality, right? Where you almost can yeah. feel the sound around you, grab it and then manipulate it. Yeah. And it was just such a like a gah, just amazing brilliant woman that she is um and so I was like oh my god please 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 can we work together I'd love to do this for music and you know to do to work on that and she was like I'd love to but I I just can't you know she was working with Todd McEver on his opera and it's all she wasn't allowed to work with other people um especially outside of MIT um in our MIT Media Lab so I went back and I was a bit deflated and I rang up the only person that I knew who could code because I didn't know anyone I know I just used off-the-shelf stuff never occurred to me that I could build something of my own um and I rang up this guy Tom Mitch and he uh he'd helped me program a monome for my Letterman performance and I said look I want to make music with gloves um and can you help me and so he got in touch with a company called 5DT, got the University of West England to um, pay for uh, a pair of these gloves. And they were fibre optic gloves. And that's where we began. And then he began kind of developing a neural network to capture the postures. And and that's where it began. And now it's a completely different, amazing thing. Um, and I just naively thought, oh, that's probably going to take a couple of months. Um, How long have like, you been working on it? Well, now they're, they're 10 years in, but the design hasn't fundamentally changed you know for a couple of years now because we've been selling them for a couple of years but the the software is always you know developing and growing and we are you know updating um hardware too but essentially the main bulk of it has was those kind of eight years leading up to now or leading up to when we started selling them and how how has adoption been of the gloves um well you know you have to be a certain type of person to want to make music with gloves you know it's not like buying a keyboard it's a it's you've, a you've totally had some, different way some to express household names yourself. you've had some we household have, names yeah. Yeah. yeah some unusual um potentially uh yeah ariana grande was uh, was amazing she like so courageous and bold went out on a stadium tour with these you know gloves that were still all lots of wires and had to develop new technology to make sure that they would be robust in a in a stadium environment you know with wi-fi so yeah just stunning um, amazing and she did a song with them and there was this huge video that came on with this like weird british person hello i'm imogen heap and oh, da, 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 gloves something something and then she would come on with the gloves and it the kids would just be like what um but they loved it like just to see her loop her voice and then she would grab her sound and then tune her pitch it down like whatever she just looped and it was just like everyone's brain just went Pachow! um she was super cool to do that uh very very cool i mean she's actually she's actually really techy she i remember seeing her when she was 13 doing versions of my songs that where i used loop devices um just getting it like 13 i was like it's really good um, I've never so, heard yeah. that story. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So we've had her and, and some other people, but we've got like, I think there's about maybe two, 250 glovers in the world now, 250 glovers. <laughs> that's that's what you call the users? And, the, and, the glovers. and also the desktop app is that name, right? Yeah. Glover is the, uh, is the app, yeah, that connects your physical gloves to whatever software you might be using. Um, so if you're using Ableton or Logic or... Um, you can basically send it MIDI messages. It's really easy to map. Um, Ableton makes it easy to map, so it's, so it's logic. Um, and then, but you don't have to use the gloves actually with Glover. That's the cool thing because the gloves are, you know, sometimes out of people's price range. Um, I admit uh, we are trying to get it down, but you know, we're a small group of people, and a lot of it's handmade. Um, but ultimately, you can also use a Leap Motion, so you can buy a Leap Motion off the shelf, which is like. I don't actually know, £100, I have no idea. It's it's pretty cheap compared to the gloves. Um, And you can do quite a lot of stuff with it. Um, You just don't have the flexibility and the dexterity that you do with the gloves, the kind of finite uh, control. And you can't obviously move away from the the window um, of the beam on the leap motion. Um, And then you can also use your iPhone with Gliss. You can control Glover, uh, you can control Ableton with Gliss. So you could be like... 
singing a song, playing a guitar, and then lifting your arm up, and then it would like extend the reverb or how, whatever right. you want to do, filter so, your guitar, you know. So yeah. Gliss is your mobile app that kind of replicates the experience of glove without having to buy the gloves. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's using the kind of the. Toe, Oh, sorry. It's using like the gyroscope that's inside the phone to, so you can lift up, twist, turn, all that to control, yep. trigger different sounds or filters or tones, things like that. Yeah, exactly. You can so tap it cool. as well and shake it. And, yeah. When did that come out, Gliss? Um, a couple of months ago. Okay. Yeah. So it's ago. still it's still pretty new. So people might not know about it yet. Yeah. Have you yeah. seen any cool um, use cases with it so far, or are you still waiting to see uh, what to comes? To be honest, out? I haven't been paying attention. Okay. Um, I've been on, I've been on other things. Um, I know that there are some really incredible projects going on with the gloves. Um, yeah, just there's there's a woman who's taking them up into space, um, to the space station. Um, there's a really amazing glover called Chris Halpin who has cerebral palsy and he's taught us a lot about um, accessibility um, and how to develop the software um, for people who have limited, you know, um, physical expression. Um, and uh, amazing woman called Angie who's developing something for her child um, who's nonverbal. So it's not just music, um, you know, people are doing all kinds of things with them. It's pretty fun. Yeah, that's that's super cool. So um, I'm curious to ask you beyond this stuff. We, we've talked about a lot of stuff here, from from blockchain to NFTs to expressive uh, instruments. What other trends in music tech get you excited these days? Um, well, I'm I'm just excited. I'm excited about the intersection of where VR comes into it um, mm -hmm. and AR mixed reality. Um, I mean, I've just been exploring this uh just actually because of the nft um a couple of people got in touch a guy called will o'brien who i met a few years ago he's a musician um and bt and they were like we've got this thing to show you it's called the nft oasis and you go and check out nfts before they're you know up for sale it's like a gallery type thing um and but what we did was we helped we did our sessions in clubhouse and then after there'd be an after party in the in the nft oasis so they built this beautiful little space for me and i did some performances to a green screen here in my house, um, jamming live with people on Endless, you know, because that's what the NFTs were made with. And just from like 20, 30 people around the world, live jamming in VR, watching people on my screen from the headset of Will, um, looking out onto the crowd. So I could see, you know, they were sending me love hearts and because I couldn't wear my visor at the same time as playing mm. um, because I want to be able to see what's going on um so yeah and i'm excited about how we can integrate the glove technology um with something like oculus quest how we can use them as controllers and make music and start to you know intersect there um and then you know musical worlds and so many things you know i mean when, when it gets to the point where it's quite the norm to you know, go and have a little party with some friends in a VR space. I mean, it is already for many people. And I had some fun evenings with some people just flying around, um, actually a, like an old Coachella uh, and a beautiful forest with some deer and floods and stuff. It was like, it's just crazy stuff that I didn't know existed. Um, and just experiencing that social side of it, especially during lockdown. So I'm, I'm excited for how fans can integrate into the music in the VR space, you can have this real connection and how people can walk into spaces and worlds. So at the moment, you know, we might create a, a piece of music and it's just kind of, it's a beginning and an end, beginning, middle, and end, like a song, is a song. There it is, a finished file format, you can't really do anything with it. But if you walk into a space, um, all of that stuff that you've done in your studio, you might have tons of extra material that you didn't use or, you know, drum machines kind of doing fun things and patterns that you could start to build and cross over into worlds and, you know 360 sound and just there's so many possibilities um so yeah i'm just slowly slowly just when i can a project comes up and i just start to experiment and see what's possible 
and just want to keep doing that really <laughs> it's so it's so wonderful to see and hear about i feel like I've, I've just learned this great through line of everything you've been doing for your career of that's really about curiosity and just pulling the thread of curiosity and just keep going with it keep going with it and now you know you've done so many things you talk about the gloves you worked on starting a decade ago um you know and and you're still kind of like oh reimagining what could be done with them you know with with vr i love that story you told when you first discovered this idea that you could physically capture the sound with your fingers and then manipulate it and now it's almost like you're operating in the dark when you do that because you can't actually see the sound and yeah. now you're saying you put on the visors you get into this vr community this augmented world mixed reality and then maybe you actually can start to see things that you couldn't yeah, exactly. see before yeah. and other people can see them too and yeah. um it's like i don't know i love this idea that um real innovators creative innovators uh, successful entrepreneurs business leaders can go from that 10,000 foot view all the way down to that microscopic view and then back up again and i feel like mm. you're doing that with sound waves you're doing that with technology with your art and with the the business model it's so cool to see this oh, has been thanks. an absolute <laughs> blast imogen thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us so how do we keep up with everything you're up to is there is there some place we can go to to keep up with what you're doing next yeah, thank you. Um, well, I did kind of slightly step back a little bit from social media. Um, so I don't really post so much on there. But I do have a really lovely community of heapsters, as they call themselves. <laughs> um, I have an app, which is just imogenheap.app. And it's a couple of quid a month if you want. Um, and then we have a Discord channel there. And I also have an ongoing project every Thursday. In fact, I'm doing it today, um, where I just chat to whoever wants to talk to me directly um, on a screen. I'm in my listening chair, which is a physical egg chair with some like tech in it. And it's analyzing my, well, it's kind of taking notes of my uh, emotional um, expression, my, my expressions. So to contextify the, the words that I'm saying when it when it pull, gets put into text and then we condense those question and answers and push them into a knowledge store so that future questions um, from fans can be answered by augmented Imogen which at the moment is a kind of chat bot but in future who knows what she's going to be or they are going to be who knows uh, it might be a cityscape or it could be whatever you want depending on your emotional state of being um, so yeah we do that every Thursday so if there's anyone out there with a burning question uh, I probably haven't answered it um, you can come in get a ticket and uh, ask me a question and I love those sessions that is amazing uh, super cool to hear about and I guess people can go to imogenheap.com as well <laughs> They can, yes. And all my projects are linked on there too. Yeah. You're a nut and the best kind. Thank you so much. <laughs> this has been an absolute blast. Appreciate you taking the time to join us on Music Tectonics and can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. It's been fun. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Music Tectonics. If you like what you hear, please hit subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We put out new episodes every week. Want more? Find it at musictectonics.com. You can dig deeper into this episode, learn about our annual conference, get the Music Tectonics app, and sign up for our newsletter. Musictectonics.com has it all. Also, look for Music Tectonics on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Clubhouse. And connect with me, Dimitri Vitsa, on LinkedIn. Peace. You're listening to Music Tectonics.